Welcome to Second Presbyterian Church. Today we are called to worship from Psalm 117. It reads, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. This morning let us praise the Lord together. Amen. we pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling, the privilege, and the blessing of corporate worship. You inhabit the praise of your people. You alone are worthy of adoration, affection, and allegiance. Today and every day, may we offer you, you the worship that you alone deserve, in which you delight, and for which we were made for. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. Would you consume us afresh, would you humble us again and liberate us for your glory as you grant us a fresh awareness of your holiness and grace. Father, we, we don't want to give you mere lip worship or empty ritual or rote liturgy. Would you pour out your spirit on us, Father? Make us to a holy hush and an unparalleled joy. For our worship is vain apart from your spirit's work and presence in our lives. May our worship be a sweet aroma to you a transforming power for us, and a mercy agent for others. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now in light of God's amazing holiness and his grace in our lives, let us continue in worship by giving back to God the gifts of God. In your, uh, in your bulletin printed there, you'll see the many ways that you can give. We'll also be passing the plates. Amen.
Let's pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, you are our eternal King. And we come now with hearts full of thanksgiving. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. And you have lavished us with your abundant grace. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, as we bring these tithes and offerings to you, we ask that you would be pleased to multiply them, expand your kingdom, and magnify your name in all of the earth. We love you, Father, and it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Friends, so glad you were here worshiping the Lord with us. Why don't we take a moment and greet those around us. Well, again, good morning. So glad you are here worshiping the Lord with us this beautiful Sunday morning. Just a couple of announcements as we continue on in our worship. First, there should be a red notepad, what we call the friendship pad, located toward the center of your row. If you could find it, sign it, and pass it down. This is just a great way for us to know who is here and how we can pray for you. And when it gets to the end of your row, if you could pass it back towards the center. That way you can catch those names on your row. Just a couple of announcements for today uh, going on uh, after the service and uh, later on at 4.30. Uh, we have a couple of missionaries in town, um, Raju and Catherine, who have been serving for nearly 20 years in South Asia. Uh, they've developed a, a holistic ministry called KTM. They do a lot in that ministry. I'll read some of the things. They're They train church planters, they educate children, provide job training, run a regional hospital. It's amazing work they're doing. They are in town and they will be sharing and we'll be praying for them. So you can come hear their story, uh, hear their update at 4.30 in room B100. And so come and make plans to attend that. Also, following this service, I have sad news, but uh, today is last day for our brother and friend Samuel Metzger. Uh, He is leaving uh, our church to go serve at a sister church in Nashville. So we'll be having a reception following this service in the fellowship hall. Uh, And so we thank him so much for serving our church faithfully. Why don't we thank him right now for serving our church faithfully. Samuel is one of the most talented persons I know. All right, lastly, children, I want to invite you up. Mr. Brad has a special word for you. All right, kids. Join Uncle Brad up here up front. Oh, this backpack is heavy. Hey, I know you. I know you too. Hey, you want to come over here? Nice. Well, quick question. Can anyone tell me what's on my back right now? A backpack, yeah. This is my favorite one. I've had it for a really long time. So I wanted to bring it and show y'all. Just give me a minute to get it off. This is heavy. Oh, here we go. Man, that's heavy. Let's see what's making it so heavy. Let's see what we have in here. No wonder why it's so heavy. Look at this. Look at all this weight. Look at that. 
It's like 500 pounds. What? I will never be able to carry this. Now that I think about it, oh, I'm breathing hard. Gosh, that's heavy. Now that I think about it, this kind of reminds me of our relationship with Jesus and how in life there are certain things that we're supposed to do that we don't always do, like not touching the weights and like saying grace before we eat lunch. You know, when we get really hungry, it's sometimes hard to remember to say grace. Or being nice to our brothers and sisters or people who are different than us. You know what the Bible calls that when we don't do the things that we're supposed to do? Anybody have a guess? Sin. And kind of like these heavy weights, sin can be pretty heavy to carry. Not only is it heavy, it's kind of impossible for us to carry our own sin. You want to know some good news, though? In Isaiah chapter 53, the Word of God says that the Lord put all of our sins on Jesus, and Jesus carries our sin for us. And that's really good news, because Jesus, unlike me, unlike you, is actually strong enough to carry our big load of sin. So that means that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, we no longer have to carry this impossible weight. Instead, Jesus comes into our life, and he puts the sin on his back, and he carries it. And we get to be free. Isn't that good news? Is it really good news? Or are y'all just saying that? Is it really good news? All right. Let's pray and thank Jesus for that good news. Lord, thank you for giving us Jesus, who's strong enough to carry all of our sins. Would you help us to have faith in him to actually do that? And will we get to experience the freedom that we have in Christ? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. See y'all later. Thanks, Brad. And that is good news. We do have a God who carries our sin, not only our sin, he carries our burdens and carries us through life. So in light of that, let us go to our God in prayer. Would you stand with me as we go to him with prayers of intercession? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence and power of your Holy Spirit with us this morning. We thank you for the encouragement and the restoration that you bring to our hearts as we worship you. And Father, we come to you and asking that you would carry us with our prayers and concerns. Father, we lift up those in our congregation that have lost loved ones. We pray for the Davis family, Tyler, Laura, Riley, and Katie on the death of their son and brother, John Wynn. We pray that you would comfort and strengthen this family, that they would be able to cling to your hope and love during this sad and difficult time. And Father, would you bring them joy as they celebrate the life shared with him? Father, would you be with this family? We thank you for also the many mission partners that you've given us to partner with us. We thank you for sending out those of us from this very congregation. We pray for our sister Haley as she serves in Jordan. We thank you for blessing her with many gifts, including medical gifts and the gift of compassion. We pray that you would bless her work at the Anor Sanatorium. We pray for the, the people that come to see them. We pray that they would be healed physically, but more important, they would be healed spiritually. Would you work through Haley and encourage her? Father, we also pray for our many local partners here in this city. We pray for Binghampton Christian Academy. We thank you for their desires to develop students both as scholars and as godly leaders. We pray that they continue to make plans for this upcoming school year, that you would give them your spirit to lead and guide them to walk into many good works that you have prepared for them. Father, we also thank you for our own ministries here at this church. We pray for our college ministry, campus outreach, and the rich history here at Memphis and Rhodes, but also throughout our region. We pray for our staff now as there are many different summer projects. We pray that the students with them would dig into deep into God's word 
participate in biblical community, and readily share their faith. Father, would you use them to raise up laborers on the campus for the lost world? Father, we also pray for our children's ministry and the many volunteers involved with Vacation Bible School this coming week. Would you bring many children to these different VBS sites? Would you bless all the logistics involved in planning and leading? And would you encourage the leaders they serve long hours? And Father, would you plant your word deep inside our children's hearts? And would you have your word not return void? Father, these are all our prayers and these are all requests. We lay them at your feet. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to see you again after a couple of weeks of rest. Thank you for that. And it is wonderful to be back worshiping with you. And we turn to a new book then in our study of the Minor Prophets. We haven't departed from that series. Um, uh, Pastor Todd preached for the last couple of weeks on Acts chapter 2, which is the fulfillment of the prophecy made in Joel chapter 2. And today we only have time for cause of communion, we only have time for a brief introduction, relatively brief introduction to the book of Joel. But I want you to see the good news that is in this book as well. We are turning to it, not because it follows right after Obadiah, you know that already. Uh, we've studied Obadiah, that one-page book, for a few weeks. But when I introduced this series, I said we would study these books in chronological order, 
not canonical order the way they appear in the Bible, but the, in the order of the time in which they were written. So Obadiah written early in the ninth century, Joel written in the ninth century as well, the 800 years before the birth of Christ. And uh, we're doing that because I want you constantly to see that the single story of the whole Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not that the Old Testament is about one kind of God, the New Testament about another. It's not that one is just preparing for the person of Jesus, but for the work, it is explanation throughout the whole of the Bible, the explanation of how God saves us, and that is by the sacrifice of His Son, that He gave us because He loved us. Now, when we start reading Joel, you're going to say, what in the world? I thought you were talking about a God of love. This is uh, really disturbing, these insects that are, that are eating everything in sight. This doesn't sound like a God of love. But remember, we started a series of the Minor Prophets saying that God is crazy in His love for us. That when He sees us wandering from the path, when we are living in a way that's not honoring to Him and dehumanizing to ourselves, God becomes crazed with love. The surprise of this book that was revealed by Todd when he preached on Acts chapter 2, the surprise of this book is that the curse that we are due is actually one that he brought on his son. That's how crazy his love is, that he would sacrifice his son to draw us back to himself. I want you to see in this book that, um, that, that Joel is true to his name. We don't know much about, we don't know anything about this Joel. There are lots of Joels in the Bible. We don't know anything about this Joel except what is written here. But we do know that his name means God is God. We don't know anything about his father, Pethuel, except that we know that that name literally means God is good, God is true, God is sincere. And is that not what we need to know in our culture, in our personal lives? When there are things that are disappointing to us, things that we are suffering, things that we are afraid of, don't we need to know at one and the same time, God is God and God is good? And whatever we don't understand in the middle of those two truths, that is enough for us, especially given a God who has proven that He is God and good by the gift of His Son. The an expectation of, being, of finding the gospel revealed in this book as well. We turn to chapter 1. We're going to read all of chapter 1, and then I'll point you to two verses in chapter 2. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children to another generation what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine, splintered my fig tree, stripped off their bark, and thrown it down. Their branches are made white." Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail. O oh, wilderness, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished, the vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar, go in 
Go in and pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. And how the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for His land, and He had pity on His people. Verse 32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Brothers and sisters, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we would behold wonderful things, humbling, converting, encouraging things from this portion of your revealed gospel. In Jesus' name we pray it. God's people said together, amen. In 824, A.D. 824, 824 years after, after the birth of Christ, there was a famine. The crops were failing in the Osta Valley of Italy. Crops were failing, and the people got together to figure out what the reason was. They called together uh, those who were farmers as well as those who were leaders, and especially church leaders, since at the time the church led everything. They concluded that the problem was not uh, because of a lack of rain or because of, uh, of above-ground pests or, or because of their farming practices or the quality of the soil. Certainly not because of anything they had done. The problem was the moles. They concluded it was the moles who were to blame. And in the Middle Ages, it was not uncommon to put animals on trial. I found a doctoral dissertation once. This is the kind of goofy things pastors do. A doctoral dissertation about trials of animals. They were middle age, middle uh, trials in the middle ages of mules and horses and cows and so forth, and moles. The moles were put on trial by the church, and guess what? You guessed it. They were found guilty. And the punishment was excommunication. We're going to show them. I don't know that they were in the habit of celebrating the Lord's Supper or communing, but they weren't able to do it anymore. But it meant more than that in the medieval church. It wasn't just cut off from the Lord's Supper. Excommunication was meant moles, these moles, will go to hell. You thought all moles went to heaven. But here they were condemned to hell. They were blamed for all of the problems with their crops. Isn't that unenlightened, uninformed, ridiculous so immature, so unscientific, and so like us. Because we, like those in the Middle Ages and those people in that situation, have a propensity, a tendency to play God instead of pray to God. To play God rather than pray to God. Instead of turning to the Lord, weeping, wailing, crying, all of the verbs that are used in this passage, and crying out to God, help us, only you can help us, they find someone, something to blame. 
and without taking any responsibility for themselves. These Israelites did exactly the same thing. The problem, they concluded, with their, with their economy, the problem with their safety, the problem with their physical health, the problem with their society was these locusts, these bugs, instead of turning to God, especially a God who had already revealed Himself as sacrificially loving and would be incarnate in Jesus Christ. Joel has a simple message for us in this book that we'll only introduce relatively briefly today, but two points. God is crazed with love when we turn our backs on Him. And He takes action that we can interpret to be violent against our sin and against those things that we have put our trust in other than Him. Because He loves us. And when those things are happening in our lives, when there is a need, rather regardless of whether you're directly responsible for it or not, when there is any need, the point is turn to Him. Wake up and turn to Him. And then secondly, God is love. And because He is love, cry out to Him for that love, to know it, to live in response to it. That first point opens uh, in verses 1 through 12, that God's love can be manifested in violent ways against things that we have come to trust more than Him. Now, just how devastating was this, this action, this locust plague that is described throughout this book. Let me just give you some insight into it because we're not really familiar with locust plagues, thank the Lord. There was a locust plague as recently as 1988 in West Africa, in Chad. When there was civil war there, they weren't able to spray insecticides and, and because they were not, the locusts multiplied and they threatened to sweep not just through Chad but through West Africa and even leap into Europe. In, in 1960s, or 1960 exactly, there was, a, there was a locust plague in California that destroyed 200,000 acres of farmland. But it was a plague that hit Syria, Syria and Palestine in 1915. Someone showed me once a National Geographic from 1915 uh, about this plague. This plague of locusts that descended on Palestine and Syria. And here's the way it unfolded, and it gives us insight into the various words used to describe these locusts in their various stages. The old KJV used canker, palmer worm, and canker worm, and caterpillar, and locust. And uh, those various stages were illustrated in 1915 when thousands of Locusts, female locusts, descended in Syria and Palestine and laid their eggs. In, in the four inch deep holes, they laid their eggs. And there were 650,000, between 650 and 750,000 eggs per one square meter of land. Now, those eggs hatched. And the Juvenile, the, 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 the new, newly birthed locust can only hop. It doesn't have wings. And so it'd eat a little bit and hop, eat a little bit and hop. And it could hop 400 to 600 feet per day. And then it would molt, and, it, and then it, it grew juvenile wings, kind of clipped wings. So it would hop and fly a little bit, hop and fly a little bit. It covered more territory and ate everything in its sight. And then it molted again. And it grew into a three-inch long bug with a ravenous appetite that could fly for hundreds of miles. And it destroyed absolutely everything else. And when all of the vegetation on the ground had been destroyed, then the locusts would gnaw their way into trees and eat the pith out of the trunks and out of the limbs so that the trees 
splintered like they're describing here in verse 7. They splintered and failed. They even fell. They even ate cacti. They ate everything. Total devastation. And what did that mean for this agrarian society, the agrarian economy? It meant that their grain went away, obviously. They had a crisis of grain. They had a crisis of oil. And they had a crisis of wine. They weren't able to eat the engine or the fuel of their economy, oil, was gone. And that which brought them pleasure, wine, was gone as well. What was given to gladden the heart, as the Bible says. Sounds somewhat familiar, does it not? We have things in our society that we grow accustomed to, that we lean on, that bring us much joy and comfort, and we can take these gifts without thanking the giver. Our grain can disappear in the form of baby formula. We can have rising gas prices. Those places that we presumed would be safe places, like places of work and schools and, and sanctuaries and hospitals and the public square, and a grocery store, no longer safe places. What we take for granted as gifts from God, we forget the giver. And what is our tendency when these things happen, when this kind of deprivation occurs? Our, our tendency as fallen human beings is not first to turn to the Lord. Our tendency is whom can we blame? What mole can we find? What person, what political party, what official, what unseen force, whom can we blame? Rather than the simple first step that is repeated 13 times in these first 12 verses, Variously said ways of turning to the Lord. That's repentance. We spent the last several years arguing about repentance as a culture. Denying repentance. Denying that we need repentance. That's who we are. Repentance is simply turning to the Lord. And even if the situation is not directly due to your sin, and not every suffering is, we at least acknowledge that every deprivation, every bit of suffering is the result of the fall. And we are sinful participants in the fall, and we are helpless without Him. We are trying to lift those backpacks that we cannot bear, not just our individual sin, but the brokenness of this world. And the first place, the first thing to do is to turn back to the Lord. Why does He bring this devastation? Our text tells us for various reasons. The first thing it tells us that with which he shocks the people of Israel is that it's the Lord who brought it. The Lord has allowed this to happen. The, the people's hearts are more important to him than their physical comfort. So allowing a locust to destroy everything that they've come to rest in rather than worship Him, is not beyond the doing of a loving Lord. He brings devastation when we, and these various reasons, He brings devastation when we are, have come to the point where we take His gifts and refuse to thank Him for them. You know, one of the most fundamental marks of of original sin or the depravity of human beings, the Bible says in Romans 1, is thanklessness, ingratitude. The, the way to cure doubt, by the way, the Bible teaches in James 1, the way to cure doubt is not making yourself believe more. The way to cure doubt is to start giving thanks, to be grateful. You may not find it possible to give thanks for the very particular heartache that you're going through right now, but there are many other things, many other reasons for which to give the Lord thanks. These people had come, uh, become accustomed to receiving His oil and grain and wine, 
and, and these material and, and comforts, but not giving him thanks. And God sent this devastation to turn them back. Now, he's not, it's not because he's a, he's, such, he's a petty God that says, if you're not going to thank me, I'm going to punish you. But because, as he explains in this text, when we become ungrateful, when we take just, when we take the material and sensual things that God has, has given to us that he calls good gifts, when we take them and we, and, and we just want more of them and we never give him thanks and never serve him with them, never share them, we become less than human. We dehumanize ourselves. We not only fail our calling, these ministers were failing their calling because they were chasing the money. These, these farmers were missing their calling because they were forcing the land to do what it was not created to do. They were just providing for the indulgence of the people. And the result was the creation itself cried out in pain. Everyone was in pain. Everyone was acting now like an animal. Just feed me. And God said, I made you for so much more. I made you for so much more than someone who's just looking for the next thrill, the next acquisition, the next achievement. I made you in my image to be a king, a queen, to rule with me in my kingdom, to participate in my, the forward movement of my king. I made you for so much more. God loves us too much to leave us to those indulgences that reduce us to orphans and animals. So what do we do? Besides repenting, when we turn back to the Lord, when we turn back to the Lord, what do we say? Well, that word or the or the the, there, there are various synonyms throughout the text that all mean the same thing, cry. Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord for His love. Cry out to the Lord for His mercy. That's what we cry out for. Why? Because that's who He is. It's not that we, we cry out and, and that, you know, once we have once we have debased ourselves enough, when we have spoken uh, badly about ourselves enough, once we have changed enough of our behavior, God will finally accept us? No. No matter how far you have, you have wandered from the Lord, no matter how hard you have turned your back against Him, the road back into fellowship with the Lord is always shorter than the road away from Him. It's instant. It takes us a long time if we've, if we've been Christians wandering away from the Lord. It's instant to get restored to Him. You turn back. Let me explain that a little bit more. The phenomenon that I see explained in this, in this book and, uh, and throughout uh, Scripture, this, this, this growth in the gospel-centered life. That's why I turned you to chapter 2, verses 18 and 32. I wanted you to see those two things, that the Lord loves you, and He calls you to cry out to Him that you might experience it. Now, here's how a theologian named Soren Kierkegaard described the maturity of a Christian or what we would call a Christian who is living a gospel-centered life. There's plenty of a Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian that we would disagree with. And he was doing the best he could in a secular culture. But something amazingly happened to Kierkegaard. He was, he, he, his first love, a woman he thought he was going to marry, was that, that love was taken away from him. He never recovered from it. He was called the depressed Dane, surely behind his back, the depressed Dane for the rest of his career. But it made a tremendous change in his theology, away from the cold academic theology in which he had been trained into a warmer, more affectionate relationship with the Lord. He described the mature 
the maturation process of a Christian like this. He described it with three words and three stages. He said there's orthopraxy and orthodoxy and orthopathy. Ortho is right, right, um, right practice or praxis, right doing, and right believing, orthodoxy, and right loving, orthopathy. Now, here's how he went on to describe. He said, he said, you know, we're all born, he says, aesthetics, or we might say materialists. We're all born dependent on, on sensory comforts, on things that will, will comfort. We're all born crying when we're hungry. We're all born wanting comfort. And that is our natural tendency for the rest of our lives unless the Lord interrupts that process and brings us to Himself. We become those who just look for one thrill after the other or one acquisition after another. And, and Kierkegaard said if we are not turned away from that materialism, then we devolve into the demonic. That's pretty severe, but the Bible says materialism is, is witchcraft. We brush it up a little bit even by calling it idolatry. But to, to, to give in only to the senses and not to live for the Lord is to live like an animal and to become captive to the evil one. So he says uh, the first stage of our Christian experience tends to be changing our behavior. We tend to think, well, the, you know, the first thing, if, since I've become a Christian, I need to live a different life. I need to quit doing those things I used to do. I need to do these new things. That's orthopraxy. But if you didn't grow beyond that, you would be a legalist, you'd be a moralist, you'd be a Pharisee. There's, there's more to the Christian life than that, more than just doing the right thing, keeping the Ten Commandments. You need to do it for the right reason. And those right reasons are revealed in Scripture. That's orthodoxy. And so you come to the point of saying, I want to do the right thing because this is what the Bible teaches. Even though it's not exactly comfortable for me, I, I, this is what the Bible teaches, and I'm committed to doing that, so I'm going to do the right thing for the right reason. But if you stay there, you will also not be a gospel-centered, thriving, flourishing Christian. You'll just be someone who does the right thing for the right reason. You'll be like a Pharisee. And so Kierkegaard said, there must be another phase of maturity, and that is orthopathy. And that is to do, pathy, that is to do what you do, not only because there's a right reason, but because you love the Lord. And you recognize that you, you love Him because He first loved you. Did you catch that in this beautiful old poem set to music by Jane Marshall many years ago? This, this anthem that we sang this morning, uh, not the least of the reasons for it is because it's Samuel's favorite, and I love it as well. But look back at that anthem. My God, why do I love Thee? Not because I hope to get heaven, not because I hope to escape hell, but I love thee because thou didst me upon the cross embrace. Nails and spears pierced you. You embraced my disgrace. I love you because you first loved me. No matter where you are, in your life, even if you're not a Christian, you must understand today that no matter what our questions might be about suffering, why does God allow suffering? Why did He allow this to happen in my life? Why did He allow this to happen in the world? Why did He take this loved one away from me? Why did He allow this child to die? Why, why so many people killed in the, in, in the shootings? No matter which of those questions we cannot answer to every one of them, we have to admit that God has put Himself through worse. That Jesus, who could have turned all people into gold, chose to live as a poor man. Though He could have built mansions in heaven, chose to live without a place upon which to lay His head. 
A, a, a man who created everyone became rejected of men. One who, who given life to the creation, allowed himself to be persecuted and tortured and killed. A God who created all of us and His Son did nothing wrong, turned His own Son over to hell to be killed. No matter what else we cannot understand about the suffering in this world and why it should happen to us or to otherwise innocent people, we must admit that God has experienced all and worse. And it's that one who says, I deprived myself. I paid the ultimate cost, not just of death, but of separation from my son, separation from my father. I paid that price that you might not have to be separated from me forever, and that I could someday set this creation free from all of this suffering. I love you that much. So come to me. Cry out to me. Yes, if you need to confess your sins, repent of your sins, but cry out to me. To know my love, which restores and heals. And it is most appropriate that we follow a sermon like this as we follow the preaching of the Word every Lord's Day with the Lord's Supper. It's not always in the morning. It's always appropriate to preach the, 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 the promises of the gospel and be able to point objectively to this table that the Lord Jesus Himself spreads for us, saying, I put my body in the place of the hell and the wrath you deserved. I spilled the life-giving substance of my body, my blood for you, that I might redeem you from your sin and from the brokenness of this world and give you eternal life in the next. And in that place, celebrate with you permanently the beauty of this supper. So as you will walk forward for these elements today, come to Jesus for the first time or the thousandth time. Cry out to Him for His mercy and for His love. That is the gospel that we profess today, and I ask you now to stand and confess it yourselves with the confession of faith that you find on page 6 that the church has been reciting at least since the 3rd century. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
friends, the Lord Jesus invites you to this table this morning. But before we come, let us confess our sins together and experience his forgiveness together. If you're able, we ask that you kneel during this time as we come to the Lord in humility, but also expectant hope of his renewing grace. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious Father, you poured your spirit upon your gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. Pardon us for our reluctance to share your gospel with our friends. Forgive us for remaining content to be only hearers of your word and not doers. Our lives are frequently dominated by faithless fears and worldly anxieties. In your mercy, transform our timid and faithless lives by your powerful spirit so that we live as fully devoted followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom name we pray. Now hear us, Lord, as we offer our silent and individual prayers of confession. Amen. May you return to your seats. Brothers and sisters, there is great news. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Brothers and sisters, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. To assure us of that good news, Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper. And in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for the many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes, said the Apostle Paul. He followed those words of institution with words of warning, saying that those who come properly to this table are those who come despairing of their ability to earn their favor with God, but come trusting in Jesus Christ alone and embracing the love that is found illustrated in this supper reaching toward us. If that is not your faith, then we still invite you to come forward, walk forward. Uh, An elder will come by the pews and give you directions in the balcony about when you are to walk forward. Just come with everybody else. No one will force you to take the elements, but we want you to come and see how closely the Lord Jesus has grown, has come to you. And uh, we pray that before you leave this place this day, Christ will have become your Lord and Savior. If you are not able to walk forward, just catch the eye of uh, a couple of the elders will be walking throughout the sanctuary uh, looking for those who need to be served in their place. Let's pause, set these elements apart for his use in concluding with the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding our consciences so faithfully. Take these elements and set them apart from all common use. And because your Holy Spirit is real, make our experience with you real this day as you confirm to our consciences that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners and that God is is the God of love. We pray it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Join us for a reception for Samuel after his postlude in the fellowship hall. Would you stretch forth your hands for his blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his loving countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.